chapter uh, 18, I believe, right? Okay. We're in chapter 18 of Living on the Edge, and the title is, Are You Building Relationships That Will Last a Lifetime? That's a good question, isn't it? And uh, or have you answered that question already? Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> Are you building relationships that will last a lifetime? That's a really poignant question that Chip Ingram asked. <laughs> Sister Hubbard says she tries to. Um, all right. So I want to... Um, you know, there's a, a profound paragraph on the first page there, uh, and I just want to summarize it. I want to read the whole thing on page 177. But Chip says, real rewards of authentic community require the real you showing up and meeting real needs in the lives of others, but not the ones that are convenient, easy, or emotionally inexpensive. Uh, that's tough, isn't it? There's nothing about uh, that profound statement uh, is easy to digest. It makes you think about things for a little bit, doesn't it? And it makes you kind of reflect upon your own life and your own relationships and start assessing, how well am I doing? Um, do I take the convenient way or am I going out of my way um, to build a long-lasting relationship? Um, for me, and this is how I kind of want to uh, lean into the lesson, when I think about that statement, I think about uh, Jesus in John 15 and 13, uh, where the Lord says um, something about a greater love. You remember that passage? What did Jesus say there? We should all know that one. You see how Jesus made a connection with relationships and love. You notice that? And in fact, in, uh, and I can't remember the count, but there are several occasions in the Gospel of John where he talks about love and relationships, or friendship, love and friendships. And by the way, those are two overused words uh, in our country. Uh, there's more people that talk about friendship or relationships and love and really have no idea what they really mean, do they? Uh, overused but often misunderstood. Uh, we're quick, especially children, right? And you probably remember this when you were a child. You're quick to call somebody a friend. Well, why is that your best friend? Well, they let me have some candy. And that sealed the deal. Yahweh, Ace Boom Coon for life. But as you mature, you begin to understand that it's more than sharing a piece of hamburger or hanging out in the hallway uh, that as it relates to friendship or relationship. Um, and you came to that realization based upon a need, didn't you? When you needed somebody, and that one or maybe that second person came in your and hung in there with you, then you realize and were able to redefine friendship. But it's only then when you're going through something will you really appreciate what relationship or friendship's are all about, right? And I believe there's a connection, there's a connectivity between friendship or relationship and love. And I think Jesus makes that, that connection. Um, let me ask you this before we, we, we plow ahead. Uh, as it relates to friendship, uh, is it mandatory for a relationship or friendship uh, to have reciprocity? No. Why do you say that?
okay. Amen. He, he, he gave his own amen. So I think, I guess that deals with it. I'm not going to say. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. You're absolutely right. And we'll kind of touch on some of that uh, in a little bit and kind of challenge that statement just a little bit as well. But again, John 15, 13 uh, Jesus makes that connection. He says, greater love had no man than this than a man laid down his life for his friend. And so he's talking about love. And I have a few, um, few bullet points here as it relates to love and friendship. And the first one, um, I'm saying here that the source of love is the nature of the lover. And that's what really makes it challenging. Because it's hard to love if you're not lovable. Amen. I hope I got enough volume. Everybody heard that. If you are not a loving or a lovable person, it's hard for you to love. You ever heard the old saying, um, hurt people hurt people? Well, what was that? Broken people break other people. I take that a step further. Uh, the same idea, those who have no concept of what love is can't demonstrate it. And I don't know why they try to expect it when that person doesn't have any idea what love is. Amen? Uh, and God is the supreme example of a person whose nature is love. Uh, he loves because that's just what and who he is. And he can't deviate from that because the essence of his holiness and who he is and his person is love. Regardless of what we are or who we are, God is still love. Now, the quality of love is unconditional. Now, we're talking about biblical love. We're not talking about that fly-by, that seasonal love. That, that you're in a loving uh, uh, mood in the spring or summer. We're not talking about that. Uh, or, you, or, or sometime or then other times you're not. We're not talking about it. We're talking about true agape love that Jesus demonstrated, right? And so it's unconditional regardless of whether or not the other person is worthy or unworthy. That's an amen. Because what we have a tendency of doing is putting uh, qualifiers and criteria and stipulations on whether or not we're going to have a relationship with somebody. And God did not do that with us, did he? Bless his holy name. Because <laughs> if he did, we would be in trouble. <laughs> Amen. Uh, thirdly, love, catch this seeks the highest good of the other, regardless of the cost. You ever heard that uh, the old colloquialism, um, investing in a relationship? What does that mean? When you hear somebody saying, I'm investing in this relationship, what does that mean? Yeah, I'm putting some, in, in essence, it's costing me something. And I don't mind. Now, what I'm about to say has nothing to do with reciprocity, but there is a return on the investment. It's not as though I'm expecting something back, but I am expecting the higher good in the other person because of my investment. And I keep investing until we see something like a change or what have you. You follow me? All right. Uh, seeks the high, and, and the, the supreme example, what did it cost the father? His only begotten son. The Bible makes that clear. And then what did it cost the son? His life. Amen. The evidence of love is action. Love is always demonstrable. You can see it. Um, it's not enough to hear it. You must see it. Right? Right? And so when Jesus talked about love over and over and over again, he was actually telling them 
uh, what I'm saying is going to lead up to what I've been talking to you about. Because I've been telling y'all that God loves you and I love you, but on a Friday night, you're going to see what kind of love we actually have for you. And so love has to be demonstrated. If the love is not demonstrated, it's not really love. Amen? Amen. Um, and so the Father so loved us. You know what that word so love means, that phrase so love? What does that mean in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, begotten son. What does that mean? So love. Why did, why did he say so love? Why not just God love? Okay, Un unconditional love, okay. Overwhelming. overwhelming. A a a yeah, absolutely. An overwhelming love, amen. What else? Despite us. Um, yeah, while we were yet sinners. <laughs> yeah, and what'd you say? Immeasurable, right? It has to do with an extent. Uh, it has to do with a comparison. And so what you said, no matter what your concept or idea of love is, God exceeds that, right? He exceeds what you know about love, and that exceeding is, has been seen in his son, Jesus Christ. There's an extravagant love. It's an overwhelming love. Amen. Um, and so all of these are connected with the relationship. And when you kind of study relationship and love, you understand that it has a long lasting effect. We're not just talking about husband and wife or son and daughter or father and son or what have you. But we're talking about the, that kind of love that brings people together when you're not blood related. Right. Because it's easy to love your mom. It's easy to love your dad. That's your daddy, right? It's like he said, you should be. Easy to love family. It should be. I, I guess the more I think about it, um, you, you should. But relationship outside the family uh, takes on some, you, you have to put in some work. It doesn't just happen when, a, when, a, when parents have their child. When that child comes into, comes into the world, that's love right away. That child ain't got to do nothing. That's just love, right? But when you meet somebody and there's, for instance, not a whole lot of things in common, that takes work. That takes some investment. That takes, takes cost. Uh, and what does it cost you? It's going to cost you some time. It's going to cost you some patience. Might even cost you some money. Amen. It might. It might. Um, and so that, there's that's the connection and and what drives you to pay the cost uh, to invest in that relationship where it's love. Love does. It. Um, there was an interview, a really interesting interview I was uh, paying attention to about two or three months ago, and all of you have probably heard of Carlton Pearson. Carlton, uh, uh, I guess he's still referred to as Bishop Carlton Pearson, um, probably about 15 years ago now, uh, made this, you know, uh, bold statement uh, about universalism. And basically universalism uh, has the idea of, you know, everybody's going to heaven. Uh, you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You don't have to have faith. Uh, everybody's going to heaven. And uh, believe it or not, there are, you know, some people in our country who hold to that, that idea. Um, now, what, what, what really struck me, and I want to hear what, what you guys have to say about this. In, in the interview, he said when he was uh, going through this stuff, right, he made the announcement at the church. And as you remember the headlines, people, you know, that Sunday when he came with that, they just, okay, I'm out of here. He lost a whole lot of members. And then it just made national headlines. Everybody was, it was on KHVN, mainstream media, what have you. 
What he said recently really struck a chord with me. He said why he was going through that, I'm talking about the genesis of it, the beginning of it. He said all of his friends, these other so-called bishops, none of them would return his phone call. None of them would return an email. None of them would answer the phone. Nobody who were his friends wanted anything to do with him. What'd you think about that? Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, what did it, yes, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that would be a shame if that was the case. And, and um, you, you very well might, might be right about that. Yes, ma'am. The question that came up was, I mean, because he was a, a very influential and popular person, um, what did his peers say about it? Did they reach out to you? Did they do anything? And that was his response that, you know, I called and bounced the idea up, hey, this is what I'm thinking, was, and nobody wanted to be bothered with him. And, and what, you know, my estimation of that, my assessment, is they weren't willing to pay the cost for their reputation. Because this is like mainstream media, mainstream news now, I don't want to be seen as guilty by association. And so I'm just going to isolate him, and I'm not in a position to say that what they did was wrong because I don't know all the ins and outs. But when we start talking about relationships and friendships, that tells me maybe it wasn't what he thought it was, right? Because they put certain stipulations and criteria and said, because he now says he's this, I'm done. And who knows? I don't know. Only God knows that if some of these other bishops would have came to him, brother, let me sit with you for a minute. Over 35 years of preaching and teaching, and this is where you have been at. And here are the scriptures you have preached from. And here's what you have taught. And you're willing to abandon that. Let's go through these scriptures. He reached out to, uh, I tell you, there was one person who did come um, in, into his life around that time. And it was Oral Roberts. And Oral basically said, yeah, you might have something there. And that didn't help me at all. And, and, and that... 
and that the only thing that did was kind of validate, yeah, I think I think I'm uh, I'm on the right street now. Oral said I'm good. I'm, I must be good. It's the same. Bro well, I won't even go into those details, but you know he don't have a whole lot of credibility. Uh, but it, it just it makes you wonder, you know. Uh, what, what was the friendship, the relationship built upon? Man, he started telling these stories about how when these guys were in town and, you know, the, the ho no hotel rooms, they stayed over to the house, you know, ate, ate at my table. Uh, when they needed some money, when they were coming up, I, you know, I was giving money. You start hearing that stuff and you're like, wow. When this man has this spiritual dilemma, there was nobody who was willing to lovingly challenge his new stance. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt about that. All right, there are some uh, biblical uh, examples of lifetime friendship or lifetime relationships I kind of want to look at briefly. Uh, one that comes to mind, you probably uh, have heard this or, or remember it, is uh, David and Jonathan. Uh, everybody know who Jonathan was? Saul's son. And what's interesting about Jonathan, here was Saul who was king, and Jonathan, lack of a better word, was royalty, uh, was kind of viewed upon that he would be the heir to the throne, right? And here is David who was despised by Saul. Saul couldn't stand him, jealous of him, uh, didn't like the fact that, you know, he, he would be uh, king one day, and he was had all these victories and all this other stuff, and he wasn't uh, the king that, that God had chosen. So this man despised David. But here is this young brother, Jonathan, who had a sincere and genuine friendship with David. And it was, here, here it is, uh, when we start talking about costing and all that kind of stuff, um, there was a once upon a time when Saul tried to kill David. Actually, he tried to kill him more than one time, three or four different occasions. And because Jonathan admired, here's a man again who was, who was royalty, he's his king's son. Uh, he took off his royal garb and gave it to David, this young lad who his, son, his father despised gave his royal garb as a sign of allegiance and solidarity to his friend. And then when you look at it in 1 Samuel 18, 1 and 4, uh, it says there, Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. 
and Jonathan loved him as himself. And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan, here it is, stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. Uh, that's pretty amazing. That he, he knew his daddy was crazy. He knew his daddy was in the wrong. And this young, this young fella, David, hadn't did anything wrong. And he recognized that there was something about this brother. And I'm with him. No matter what it's going to cost me, I want to invest in a lifelong relationship with him. And it did eventually cost him something, didn't it? What did it cost him? Cost him his life. But the bond they had was that strong that he was willing to lay his life down for his friend. There was another one, Moses and Aaron. Now, they were brothers, uh, but again, a strong relationship. Here, was, here is Moses who had a, uh, a fear of public speaking. And, uh, you know, he's, he's really getting beside himself coming up with all these excuses when God told him several times you need to go, to go back to Egypt, Pharaoh's house. And, and his last excuse, well, I, I, don't, I don't talk so good when I'm in front of people. And God told him, I, you have a brother Aaron. He'll speak for you. And, and here is what that little qualifier, he says, uh, he will receive you with glad arms. He loves you. Uh, and here was Aaron and Moses. Aaron was the spokesman, but Moses was the, was the leader. And they understood each other's role, and they made it work. Strong relationship. And then a great example, one of the great examples uh, as relates to uh, uh, friendship or relationship is Christ and his disciples. Christ had a major impact on his disciples. So much so, you remember when he would, when it was getting time for him to depart, uh, when, when, when Friday was approaching, he would often try to, you know, get them ready. And he would tell him that I'm about to, and no, no, you can't go. Uh, there was another occasion where, um, uh, when he asked them that question, well, who do men say that I am? He told them who he was. And, and he told them, flesh and blood, Peter, didn't reveal this to you, but this was revealed by the Father himself. There was a relationship. Because of everything Jesus had imparted and invested in them, they were able to, and especially in that case of Peter, uh, give something back. Right? There was another occasion where um, he, where, where all those other hanger-ons, and they had departed because they didn't want commitment. They didn't want to take up their cross and follow Jesus. And Jesus asked, uh, "Were you going to leave also?" And the disciples said, well, "To whom shall we go? You, you got the words of life. We don't have any other options. We're better off with you. In fact, we're better men with you." And so that's when we start talking about the return on, your, on the investment. Christ invested into their lives, and they were able to return on that by carrying out the mission that Christ commissioned them to do. There's only one person who didn't appreciate the investment, Judas Iscariot. And, and the sad part, Jesus on one occasion called him friend. He was unworthy to be called a friend. But Jesus called him friend. Isn't that something? John 15, 15. Jesus says, uh, somebody have that in you? See if you can find that in your Bible real quick. I want to look at that. John 15, 15. Amen. Uh, Jesus tells them, 
And again, uh, his earthly ministry is coming to, a, uh, coming to a close here pretty soon. And he's telling them, now, now is the time. We've spent so much time uh, teaching, and you have observed me, and, and you are growing. And, and, and I've been checking you out, and, and you're growing in faith. And you're not where you should be, but you're not where you used to be either. And, and, and I call you. Uh, an intimate term, I call you now a friend. What Jesus was saying, what I believe what's going on here, the relationship starts with servitude. And he elaborates on this. He said a servant just obeys his master. Servant doesn't even know what the master is doing. He just, master say do something, he just does it. But a friend is in on the secret. <laughs> a friend knows what the master is doing, and the master don't mind sharing with the servant. And because of that dynamic, you have graduated from just servitude. You are now considered my friend. Now, you can't skip serving and just go straight to friend. You got to start there first. But he calls them a friend. What goes on, or why did, he, uh, why did he explain to them this unique paradigm or this unique relationship with these crazy disciples? Why did he say that? Why did he say, you are now my friend? I, I think that's it right there. There's some trust involved now. Jesus knew I've deposited so much into you. I can trust you, besides Judas, with what I have imparted in you. And what I have imparted in you is going to hold you when the heat is on. Right Now, you're going to have your bouts of doubt, Thomas. You're going to have your, your spells of denying me, Peter. But once the Holy Ghost get a hold of you in that upper room, you're going to be able to turn the world upside down. And because of that, you are now considered my friends. Why is that? Because you're going to be willing to risk your life like I'm going to risk my life for you. Trust. So the author talks about on uh, pages 177 and, uh, through 179, uh, he talks about this relationship he had um, with this sister by the name of, what was her name? Pat, Pat right? Yeah. And uh, what happened there? She was married, right? Uh, the old man wasn't around that much, so, yeah. Yeah, he was gone, newborn baby, times were tough. Rent's coming up, right? Her rent coming up. And the dilemma is his rent is coming up, but his and Teresa's rent coming up as well. And, you know, I, I thought about this. I said, I know everybody at New Rising Star would do the same thing. <laughs> okay. That was the dilemma. But there was some, um, some groundwork that was laid prior to the sacrifice. And what was that? Prayer, right? They prayed together, absolutely. They spent time together. What else? They became friends, right? And, and, and the word I love to use as relates to uh, Chip and his wife, they were sensorial, right? I've been praying with this sister. Uh, we've been, you know, having a good time, conversing, spending time. And I believe the will of God wants us to do something. That's going to cost us money. We may give you time. May give you a conversation, 
but we'll hold on to that money, won't we? That's where faith is really tested, isn't it? Faith is tested in your pocketbook. And his dilemma was, if we pay her rent, we might not have enough for ours. Has, yes, sir? Yeah, it wasn't going to have enough. It wasn't going to have enough. And I bet that brother, you know, did his math every kind of way he could do it and came up with the same answer. Wasn't going to have enough. Ten days apart. What was so fascinating about that, they stepped out on faith. Now, how do you you think uh, the sister felt about what they did? Pat. Yeah. Okay, so did they ever say, okay, look, this is all we have, and if we give it to you, we might not have anywhere to stay, but we want you to have. Did they do that? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Huh? Okay. That wouldn't have been faith, right? That's, yeah, that's your qualifying and, and, and setting stipulations and all. And really, it's guilt. Because you, in the back of your mind, you're hoping, I hope they don't take this, knowing that what I just told them. But they stepped out on faith, and they just gave it to her anyway, right? And, and I'm sure she was very appreciative and very grateful of, of what they did. But what did that do for Pat? Think about it. What did, they do, what did that do for her? They invested prayer, time, conversation. But the return on the investment was what? Increase faith, right? Sometimes, and we, again, it's not about reciprocity, but there is a unique return on the investment. Sometimes it works like this. God will use you as a channel of blessing, not for the person to pay you back what you gave them, but maybe it's to increase their faith and maybe bless somebody else, right? Right? And so we can't go around, you know, you give something. Like, for instance, if I gave Brother John some $50,000, just gave it to him, right? He needed it, I just gave it to him. Yeah. It ain't going to happen, but just suppose. If I, <laughs> hypothetically, gave $50,000. And I, I, I didn't miss the money. I just, just gave it to him. I shouldn't expect him to pay that back to me, Right? That, that's not really how, how a strong relationship works. Now, if I were to, you know, put it up front, now I'm giving you this $50,000, and in three months I need it. That's a whole different situation. But, if, but again, if he can't afford to pay it back, and I'm not hurting for it, that's his. And the reason I do that is because I'm investing in the relationship. Now, I'm not putting any stipulations. I'm not going to hang it over his head. I'm not going to remind him, well, you know you owe me $50,000, don't you? I'm investing in a relationship that's his. Now, what I would hope would happen is that the money I gave him, he had been prayed for and God answered his prayer with that money. It would also increase his faith, but when somebody else needed, Brother Hackett need $5, Brother Johnson give him that $5 with no strings attached. And that blessing just keeps multiplying. That's how it works, right? And so, and, and God answered that prayer, and it wasn't, you know, sometimes God don't come when you want him, but he's always on time. And, and they were able to make their rent Uh, And God sometimes works in mysterious ways, but he tests you, uh, tests your faith. Can I trust you to do what I've called you to do? And if you trust me, then I'll show you what I'm able to do. See, God is a, a, yes, sir. No, no. He didn't mention that. 
I, uh, I think they, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a friend of a friend. So I don't think it was a tight relationship. But the brother just said, hey, I was just compelled to give this to you. And, uh, hey, it happens. I, I'm going to be honest. I'm a recipient, and probably not that much money, but I'm a recipient of that. When you just, just, just a check just come in the mail, and, and it, boy, you needed that, and you know there was no, but you can't explain it. It doesn't make sense. What is it? Where does it come from? Why is this? It don't make sense. Yeah. God get the glory. At the end of the day, that's what happened. That's what should happen. God gets the glory from it. Amen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. So um, with that said, I just felt compelled on this last part um, because what Teresa and Chip said, they were moved by God to do this. Right. And, you know, that's one of those things that uh, that is often used in the church. Um, that the Lord led me to do this or the Lord compelled me to do this, and uh, which I believe the Lord still does do that. Um, but I also want us to realize that God has given us uh, red flags so that um, we are not abused and ran over and misused by our love and generosity. All right? Um, and just a couple of things. You know, I have on here, how can you know when God is telling you to do something? James 1 and 5. Just take a guess what, what's in that verse. Hmm? Pray. Got to pray. I, I, listen, you may feel what they used to call the unction, of, but if you haven't prayed, you might want to leave that alone. You might want to leave that alone to you. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it might be the, the enemy telling you to do something you had no business doing. Uh, I actually remember a, a, a lady, this, this, this preacher was telling him, uh, he said, the first person outdoors, God told me, uh, you're going to get a brand new Mercedes Benz. And man, them people in that church got to running out there, man. Uh, I mean, it was the, it was, it was, if it wasn't so pitiful, uh, it would have been comical. I mean, grown folk. I, I mean, with canes, and you didn't think we'll get on disability. And I mean, they just ran out the church, and this lady, I mean, she straightened up and just jetted out there. And, and I think it was either the next Sunday or the following Sunday, she pulled up in a brand new Mercedes. And uh, you just know people just, oh, look at God, this, that, and that. And about three or four years later, I had ran into her at uh, Albertsons over there off McCart. And uh, I said, I bet you got that, that car still shiny. She said, Child, no, nah, I was paying $1,000 a month for that thing. <laughs> she wasn't listening to the Holy Ghost. She wasn't praying at all on that one. Uh, no, nah, that, that's not a gift. That's a burden. Um, next one, read and listen to what? 2 Timothy 3 and 16. Read and listen to what? We got to know that one. Everybody, anybody got the Second Timothy? Go ahead and read that. Second Timothy 3.16. And isn't it amazing, if you can attest to this, that oftentimes... 
uh, a situation that you have been uncertain about is clarified in God's word, uh, both reading and hearing, something you weren't quite sure of, and then all of a sudden the preacher say something, and you're like, oh, okay, now I got it. I got you, Lord. Next one, you have the what? To help you discern what is or is not God's will for our lives. The Holy Spirit. Amen. So as relates to relationship, we've been talking about love, investment, and all that good stuff. Again, God has already given us red flags for friendship, and we find some of these things in God's word. Anything you need is found in God's word. And you've probably seen some of these verses in Proverbs. We'll read a few of them. Proverbs chapter 6, 16. Chapter 6. Amen. Uh, I think God is saying you don't have to go out the way to be a friend with those kind of people because that's going to bring you down instead of lift you up. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered one lest you learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. So what the, the author is saying if you hang around this type of person, have this kind of relationship with this kind of person, then it's going to mess you up. And God don't need a whole lot more messed up people. He got enough of them as it is. Proverbs 20 and 19. Amen. Right? So these are red flags, right? It, it, we've learned you, you, it's imperative that you invest in relationships, but God is saying, hey, wait a minute, you can't have a relationship with this person because of their character. Let me ask you this question. Is it possible to have an inauthentic relationship with an unbeliever? Huh? Why why you say no? So, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the difference between the two is 
you have to watch how you, um, uh, your association, as you just said, right? Um, watch how you, it was another word I was looking for, how you interact. Watch how you align your interaction with the person. Um, if, if we have an authentic relationship, um, that's us investing in the relationship. Uh, if it's an association, I'm on a mission, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, what I'm ultimately trying to do is influence you uh, to see Jesus as Lord and Savior. And those are two different things. Uh, That's right. That's right. And you remember, we started talking about cost, right? Jesus was willing to cost his reputation. Remember when he was uh, in the sinner's home and reclined at the table? And the Pharisee, yeah, Matthew and the Pharisee, but man, can you believe he in there eating uh, and comfortable with sinners? And, and what they didn't realize, Jesus is on a mission. You know, he's establishing a relationship because he's know eventually he's going to get the better out of that person, right? And so he was willing to cost his reputation. He didn't care what they thought or how, how they viewed him. He knew what he was doing. And I think we need to be like that. It's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Uh, but I think what the author is challenging us to do is to try to do what Pastor Edwards used to say. Uh, tell your neighbor that you're trying to love them. <laughs> needs to be some effort. It doesn't just happen. It needs to be some effort behind it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Any questions about, we'll finish up next week. Any questions or concern what we've talked about so far tonight?